so for the recording, um, <coughs> we have the test for <coughs> chapter 16 next week, but um, we're going to be covering chapter 17 now. And uh, we did our step I solution dilution, step one, step two, and now we're at step three. <coughs> if we're uh, only interested in pH, should I do step three? Or could I s potentially skip step three? If I were only interested in pH, what do you think? <clears throat> if I was only interested in step three, I would look, what is the K value for step three? This one we should memorize at 25 degrees C. It is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. This is KW. <clears throat> is this going to produce much hydronium? Would you say? No. I mean, already. Not only is it not going to produce much hydronium, we already have a, a lot of hydronium to begin with because we have to factor in step two. We ended step two with six molar hydronium, and that's what we're going to start step three with. And so we're going to have six molar hydronium to start. Water is a pure liquid, and zero molar <coughs> hydroxide. So the change is going to be um, plus x molar plus x molar. And so that at the equilibrium, we're going to have 6 plus x molar and x molar. <clears throat> so we don't expect x to be very significant compared to 6. 6 molar, it's already fairly concentrated. And we don't expect x to be a very big change. Why? Well, there are two reasons we don't expect X to be a very big change. One is the K value. Look at that K value. That K value tells me it's all reactant. And two, six molars, already fairly high concentration. And so, um, we don't expect X to be very significant compared to 6, but compared to 0, is X significant? So when we look at hydronium, it's an insignificant change, but when we look at hydroxide, it is a significant change. So uh, the hydronium's like, okay, I'm going to add a drop of water, you know, to a swimming pool. This is an insignificant change. For the hydroxide, it's like I'm going to add a drop of water, you know, to the moon. Is there very much water on the moon? Oh. People are trying to find water on the moon to colonize the planet. You know, there's frozen water there. They can melt it and sustain life. And so there it would be significant. So if I were only interested in pH, I would probably stop here, step two, you know, because I would assume that step three would add um, minimal additional hydronium. But if I'm interested in inventory, I'm just going to go ahead and continue with the whole thing. So this is going to equal the hydronium ion concentration total you know, times the hydroxide ion concentration. The total I hy hydronium is going to be from step one, step two, and step three. The hydroxide only comes from step three because it's from the collisions of the water molecules. And so this is going to equal six plus x times x. And then we're going to use the simplifying assumption. And so this will make that six and that x. And therefore, x is equal to one times 10 to the negative 14 divided by six. 
see what that is. I get x is equal to 2.0 times 10 to the negative 15. What did you guys get? I don't know. Did my calculator round that? No, my calculator rounded that off. Sorry. Yeah, it's 1.6. And that continues on times 10 to the negative 15. I'm not going to use this rounded version here. Um, and so this is really a negligible change. So if we did 6 plus 0 point, and now I need 14 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 1, 6. So this comes out to 6.1234567891012131016 14 molar. That was truly a negligible change. In fact, with something like this, then we can see that the percent change is going to be in much less than 5%. So here it wouldn't have made any difference had we done the quadratic. I mean, the percent change is so small. It's negligible. For the hydronium, for the hydroxide, it was significant. In fact, we went from nothing to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 15. So there was a significant change for the hydroxide. All right, let's double check our uh, calculation here. So times 6. Um, and so when we double check our K value, it comes out right on 1. 0 0.000 dot 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 times 10 to the minus 14. So this looks good. It depends on how many digits you carry. If I round that to 2, it's going to be off by about 20%. And so I try to minimize round, like round off error you know, by not rounding until the very end. Which doesn't mean I, I, I carry every single digit. I, I normally don't carry every single digit. <clears throat> but in this case, I did. So, um, will that change the pH much? You know, how much did we add <clears throat> to this? We added. this much here. Is this little bit of additional hydronium going to change the pH, do you think? Not at all, actually. And so this is why I'm going to skip step three uh, if I was just looking at the pH. But since we did the inventory, let's go ahead and um, <coughs> inventory the solution. So am I going to find any HCl molecules? No. Am I going to find any HNO3 molecules? No. However, I will find um, hydronium, yes. Hydronium is going to be just a hair above 6 molar. And so that's going to round to 6 molar. I'm going to have chloride. I need the, uh, was that right, 6 molar? Yeah. I'm going to have chloride at 3 molar. This is what I'm looking at here. Zero molar HCl. Chloride is at 3 molar. 
Hydronium gets carried down, so step one, step two, step three, then we have the final hydronium, in other words, the total hydronium. So the total hydronium is going to be at the very end, summing it all up. The chloride was 3 molar. The nitrate, also 3 molar. And so we'll put that here. And then what else do we have? The only thing left is the hydroxide. Hydroxide is going to be very small. This is an acid solution. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 15. Which I got to round up to 2 times 10 to the minus 15 molar. All right, any questions on this? So that's a combination of strong acids. We could have a strong acid and weak acid. It's another possibility. <clears throat> but in this case, the next example I'm going to do is a, a strong base. plus a weak base. The strong base I'm going to make as um, one molar sodium amide. Sodium amide is a strong base, and strong bases have a hard time existing in water. The strongest base that can exist in water is, do you know what it is? The strongest base that can exist stably in water. Hydroxide. All right, uh, I'm going to bump up the number of sig figs. Let's go with three sig figs. So this should be one double zero, one point double zero, and point three hundred, fifty point zero, fifty five point zero. So the first step is step I. Step I is, is what? Step I is solution dilution. So can you go ahead and uh, can you go ahead and calculate the mixture concentrations? I'll pause it. First. for the sodium acetate? All right, so now we have our mixture, which consists of 105 milliliters. 
This is going to be our reaction mixture. And then we go to step one. <coughs> what do we do here? Strongest base plus the, yeah. Um, but the weird thing is your book will, will skip this step. I'm going to go ahead and do this. And what we have here is it's not the strongest base plus the strongest acid. It's that we have a strong electrolyte. And so if we have a sodium salt, all sodium salts are soluble. So this splits up into sodium ions and amid ions. So this is optional. In other words, we could do this in our head, automatically split it up. But um, K is very large. <coughs> Soluble salt is a strong electrolyte. Strong electrolytes ionize completely. If they ionize completely, then we'll just say K is very large. And so if we have 0.476 molar here, so initial 0 0.476 molar, and we'll go with 0 and 0 here. Um, we assume that we have complete ionization. Therefore, we're going to end up at 0 molar. We're going to get 0.476 molar sodium ions and 0.476 molar amide ions. Now, sodium amide is a strong base, um, and so is that it? No, this is a soluble salt, and so the strong base comes from this, which I'll call step two. Amide, being a strong base, will react with the strongest acid present, and what is the strongest acid present? H2O. Sodium acetate is not an acid, it's base. <clears throat> then uh, what does this produce? NH3 and OH minus. What is K for this? Very large. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take the amide that was generated in step one and bring that to the start of step two. So we're going to end up with 0.476 molar amide. Water is a pure liquid. Ammonia is going to be zero molar and hydroxide is zero molar. <coughs> Since K is very large, we expect this to go to completion. So the limiting reagent here would be amide. This is going to go to zero molar. We'll have plenty of water to react. And then this is going to go to 0.476 molar and 0.476 molar here. If we did the soluble salt here, then on um, step three, we're going to do the soluble salt for <coughs> sodium acetate. All these have very large Ks. Sodium acetate completely 
ionizes into sodium ions and acetate ions. The K for this is very large because soluble salts are all strong electrolytes. And so initially I had 0 0.157, I think. Was it 157? Yeah. 0.157 molar sodium acetate. And the sodium ions, I actually have that from step one. So we'll take the sodium ions from step one and then drop those down to step three. So I'm going to start off with 0.476 molar here. And then the acetate is going to start off with zero. Okay. Since this is very large, the change is complete. So we expect zero molar sodium acetate units. And uh, we're going to add plus 0 0.157 molar here. This is going to be minus 0 0.157. This will be plus 0 0.157. 0 0.633, 0 0.157. And so we add to the sodium ion concentration, then we end up with acetate. So then we go to step four. Step four, this is a base solution. It's a mixture of bases. So what's going to be the next biggest hydroxide contributor to this? Well, we don't have any amide left over, um, but we do have ammonia. We have ammonia and acetate. And so step four is going to be either ammonia is the strongest base or acetate is the strongest base. So which one should I do? I should do the one with the larger K. And so if I look at the KB, this is going to be ammonia plus water, right, and acetate plus water. So if we look at the KB, the KB for ammonia, we can look up in the book, it's 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. However, the KB for acetate is not in the book, so I have to calculate it. The calculated KB for acetate is equal to KW divided by the KA for what acid? acetic acid. Okay. And so KW, most people have that memorized, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees C. KA, uh, most people don't have that one memorized, but that one turns out to be 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So this is a bit strange, and this makes it easy to remember. Ammonia is a very common base, and the KB of that is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, and acetic acid is a very common acid. And it has the same. It has the same to two sig figs. To three sig figs, they're actually different. So this is 1.7, dot, dot, dot. This is 1.7, dot, 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 1.79, 1.79 or something. And so the three sig figs, the uh, numbers are actually different. But this is going to give us 5.55 times 10 to the minus 10. I'm only allowed two sig figs, but I'll carry one extra. So which one's stronger, ammonia or acetate? Ammonia. And so we're going to choose ammonia as the next step. So we have ammonia plus, what's the strongest acid present? The strongest acid present is actually just water. So this is going to be our step four. And 
Alexander, so why don't you try to complete the ice table a little time to, to do that. KB for this is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5.
Uh, tell me what you got here. What was the initial ammonia? Point four seven six. Is that right? The initial water. The initial ammonium. The initial hydroxide. One, five, seven. Is that right? Point four, seven, six. The changes? Ammonia? Uh, maybe this is going to take too long. So this is going to be minus x molar plus x molar plus x molar. So um, 0.476 minus x, x, and 0.476 plus x. Um, <coughs> KB is equal to the ammonium times the hydroxide over the ammonia here. <coughs> uh, the ammonium is X, the hydroxide is 0.476 plus X over 0.476 minus X. And the the KB is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, which is kind of a small number on the smaller side. And the 0.476, that's reasonably concentrated. So we'll try the simplifying assumption. And if we do the simplifying assumption, then um, 0.476 plus x just goes to 0.476. And 0.476 minus x also goes to 0.476. And so um, x is just equal to kb, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Now, we have to justify the uh, assumption, so let's go ahead and do that. The percent change is equal to x over 0.476 times 100%. And the change is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5 divided by 4 0.476 times 10 squared percent. So what does that come out to? We could do order of magnitude also if it's really small, but 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Yeah, it's pretty small. 0 0.0037%. This is much, much less than 5%. In fact, <clears throat> with a percent change this small, even if you use the quadratic equation, it wouldn't have made any difference, at least to the sig figs that we're using it at. And so we assume the change is negligible here, but when we go back, to calculate our equilibrium, we, we don't assume the change is negligible. We actually factor that in. And so this is four zeros and then a one eight. So this comes out to point four seven five nine eight two. Which would round to point four seven six. This is gonna be one point eight times ten to the minus five. And this is going to be plus, so this is going to be 0.476, it's four zero, so 0 0.018 molar here. All right, we'll just double check the K 
really quick to make sure there's no um, errors that we can catch. Four, four, seven, six, zero, one, eight times 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5 divided by 0 0.475982 What did you guys get? So we're good. Those look good. Now, we got to look. Um, we changed the concentration of ammonia slightly, and we changed the concentration of hydroxide slightly. Will that perturb the previous step, which would have been step two here? And it does. If we change the concentration of ammonia and we change the concentration of hydroxide, that perturbs it. But we have to recall that K is very large here. When you have a very large K, it's one-way reaction. So even if we add more hydroxide, it's not going to perturb this. It's not going to go back because it can only go one way one way. One way reactions are not perturbed by Le Chatelet's principle. The other thing is, you know, we only had 0.0037 percent change. In other words, 0.0037% reaction. Since there's only 0.004% reaction, there's barely any change. And therefore, <coughs> we don't expect much perturbation, even if this weren't one way. Yeah. If we had a significant change, we could have doubled the hydroxide. And this still wouldn't have been perturbed, because the K is very large. All right, um, that's our step four. What should we do for a step five? So take a look and tell me what you, what you would do for a step five. For step five, we should just pick the strongest acid and the strongest base combination that remains. What should the strongest acid base combination that remains be? <laughs> well, we already looked at, in step four, we looked at ammonia or acetate. We picked ammonia because it was stronger than acetate. But the next strongest base is going to be acetate. And so we start off with acetate here. Strongest acid is still the same as just water. In fact, it will be acetate and water. Acetate and water is going to make what? Acetic acid. Acetic acid and hydroxide. So the initial acetate concentration, we have to go back up here and take a look. It's going to be here at the end of step three. And so <clears throat> I had it going down to step four. Four, but it's not going to step four, so let me erase that. This is actually going to go down to step five. And so we'll have 0.157 molar acetate going down to step five here. Water is pure liquid. The hydroxide is going to come from step four. And so this hydroxide will drop down here. This is going to be 0 0.476018 molar and the acetic acid is going to be zero molar. 
And so the change is going to be minus x plus x plus x. So we'll end up with 0.157 minus x molar, x molar, and 0 0.476018 plus x molar. <coughs> All right, we calculated a Kb for acetate earlier. That was 5.55 times 10 to the minus 10. <coughs> this is to two sig figs, so I'm carrying extra figures there. And this is going to equal the acetic acid concentration at equilibrium times the hydroxide at equilibrium divided by the acetate at equilibrium. And so that's just going to equal x times 0 0.476018 plus x divided by 0.157 minus x. Here, this k is so small that we expect the change to be very small. So this is just going to be x times 0 0.476018 divided by 0 0.157 as the x's drop from those terms there. And so let's go ahead and calculate what x is. <coughs> Five point five five times ten to the minus ten times point one five seven divided by point four seven six zero one eight. And I get an x of one point eight three times ten to the minus ten. So what's a bigger percent change or relative change, x versus 0.476 or x versus 0.157? What would be a bigger change? We could just do order of magnitude. 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the, <coughs> the minus 8. And this would be 10 to the minus 1, bringing up. That would be 10 to the minus 7. This is going to be way, way less than 5%. About 10 to the minus 7% change. <coughs> so a very, very small change. So let's go ahead and um, calculate it nonetheless. It's 0 0.157 minus point. All right, it's 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10. So I need um, nine zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, eight. So this is going to come out to 0 0.157, nine, nine, nine. Nine 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 seven two molar. This is one point eight times ten to the minus ten molar, and now we got to add this. So this is going to be point four seven six zero one eight. That's six decimal places. Seven eight nine one eight molar. Okay. Point one five six. No, the, the first few were seven and two. So then you subtract. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, you're right. Let me fix that. All right, let's calculate K for this.
So I carry a lot of extra digits um, for the K calculation to make sure that it, if it's different, it isn't due to rounding error. I'm off a little bit. It should be 5.55. I'm a bit off. Let me double check that. Well, it's still, I mean, it's going to come out to 5.5, but I was expecting a little bit closer. It might be because it's .157. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. What was it originally? .156. Or it could just be the I screwed up my calc when I inputted the buttons here. the calc. Let me redo the calc really quick. Point. Oh, I see. I'm going to redo the calc for X. Just to make sure. Okay. So I redid the calc. Uh, I think I just mispunched it in my calculator. It comes out to 5.550 times 10 to the minus 10. I carried some extra digits for this, 1.83, etc. And so this is a little better. Here. Okay, then I have to look. Was the change very significant? That is, will this additional hydroxide perturb the previous? And so we did add a little bit more, but how much more did we add? Because the K worked out in the previous step. In the previous, it was supposed to be 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. I got 1.8001 times 10 to the minus 5. So that looks good. But now the hydroxide has changed. It went from 476018 to 476-018-00018. So we added this little bit of additional hydroxide. Is that a significant change? Will that change my previous K value? No, I really doubt it. 
We also changed the amount of acetate from step three, but that the K was very large there, so we don't have to worry about it. So we're okay. All right, what do you think I should do for step six? All right, take a look at all the steps and, and tell me what I should do for step six. Water plus water. Anybody else? Acetic acid plus water. Acetic acid plus water. Anybody else? Let's, if we did water plus water, what do we form? From hydronium and hydroxide. But if I, if I think about hydronium, acetic acid should produce a lot more hydronium than water. Right? And I have some acetic acid from the previous step. Not only that, ammonium. Ammonium is another acid. So when I think about this, here, and I look at the hydronium, there are better producers of hydronium. For example, acetic acid produces more hydronium than water, and ammonium produces more hydronium than water, as well as water. <coughs> and so shouldn't I start off with the largest K, which in this case, the largest K is going to be acetic acid. This is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Ammonium, oddly enough, is 5.55 times 10 to the minus 10. And water is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. So it looks like the biggest would be acetic acid. So maybe this is my step six, then um, followed by ammonium, which would be my step seven, followed by water, which would be my step eight. <coughs> Should I do that? Uh, yeah, basically, uh, I won't be getting a back and forth. Um, what I would be getting is I would just be going in, um, in circles. So I guess in a way it's a back and forth, but not even in circles. What, what it is is if I look at um, this, HAC plus water, this is going to produce H3O plus plus acetate. And so what Ka, because the strongest base in this case would be water, um, this describes the equilibrium between HAC and acetate, AC minus. But we just have that. We just solve for that in step five. This is the equilibrium between HAC and acetate. So what's the difference between this step five and my proposed step six? My proposed step six is this. I'll tell you what's the same. They both describe the equilibrium between HAC and acetate. I don't want you to think that's divided. So in that sense, they're the same. What's different about them? Yeah, the one is in terms of pH and the other is in terms of hydroxide, but we're going to get the exact same numbers. 
So we're redoing the same calculation we just did. So if I chose this as my step six, then I'm just repeating the same. I'm going to get the same equilibrium um, concentrations for this. And so we don't want to do this. In fact, we don't want to look at HAC. We don't want to look at NH4+. Plus. Why? There's a simple rule for this. We go back to where we started, and we look at the mixture. This is a mixture of bases. So whenever we look at base solutions, we only look for hydroxide producers. And so um, this is not a KB. This is not a hydroxide producer. This is just the salt di dissociating. But when we go down, we only look for KBs, hydroxide, hydroxide. KW is unusual in the sense that it does produce hydroxide and hydronium. And so it's both a KB and a KA. And so this is a base solution, and so we should do the KB next for water. And so the correct answer would be water would be next because this is going to produce hydroxide. And what I want to do is I want to figure out all the hydroxide producers in a base solution. So K for this is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. It's going to be very small. And then pure water we can omit, so I'm just going to start at the initial here. Hydronium is going to be zero because this is a base solution. And the only hydronium is going to come from collisions of water, so we'll just say that no collisions have occurred yet. And so what we're going to be looking for is if there's additional hydroxide that's going to be added here. So we're going to take this down to step six. This is going to be 0 0.4760, what is it, 18000018. And then we're going to see, are we going to generate much additional hydroxide? What do you think? So plus x molar, plus x molar. We end up at x molar and 0.476018018 or triple zero one eight molar plus x molar. Do you think we're going to generate much additional? Now, there are two reasons why I don't. Reason one, we're starting off with a significant concentration of hydroxide to begin with. And therefore, Le Chatelet's principle says, well, that's going to try to push it back left, although there's zero here, so it has to go right. This is kind of pushing it left. And 2K is very small, you know, and so we don't need much additional product to achieve the correct ratio, K. And so this is going to equal the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration, which is going to equal X times 0.476 dot 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 plus X. And then we're going to, uh, we're going to go ahead and use the simplifying assumption, SA. It should work well here. So this is going to be X times 0.476 dot dot dot. And therefore, x is equal to <clears throat> 1 times 10 to the negative 14 divided by 0 0.476 
0.18018. And I get 2.1 times 10 to the minus 3, 6, 9, 12, 13, 14. So the um, change is x, the initial is 0.4 or 10 to the minus 1, so we'll just do orders of magnitude. 10 to the minus 14 times 10 squared is 10 to the minus 12 times 10 to the positive 1, which would be 10 to the 13, 10 to the minus 13. No, 10 to the 12, minus 13, 10 to the minus 11. So the 10 to the minus 11% change is extremely small. So we're okay with this implying assumption. So going over here, the hydronium is 2.1 times 10 to the minus 14 molar. And the hydroxide is going to be, um, it's going to be what? It's going to be plus 0. Point, I need 13 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13, and then a 2, 1. So that's going to equal 0 0.476. That's 3018600091 0, 0, 0, 0, 10, 11, 12, 13, 2, 1 molar. So a very small addition, um, just this much. Let's double check our K. Double check our calculations by calculating K. Times 0 0.476 0 0.18 0 0 0 0 0 And it comes out to 1.00 dot 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 times 10 to the negative 14. This is right. All right, once we get to KW, that's the end. Um, there's nothing left. So let's go ahead and inventory the solution next. <clears throat> so we started off with a solution That was a um, sodium amide, sodium acetate solution. And this is what we're going to have. Are we going to have any sodium amide formula units intact? No. Are we going to have any sodium acetate units? No. We are going to have sodium ions. And the concentration of the sodium ions, um, let's figure out where it stopped. It stopped at step three. Oh, that's way too thick. at 0.633 molar. Let's just round it. I only did this to one sig fig, so 0 0.6 molar. <clears throat> okay, what else do we have? Do we have any amide ions? No, the amide's going to come out to zero. Did it come out to zero? Yeah. Ammonia. Ammonia? Yeah. What was the ammonia concentration at the end?
9999. We've got to round this to 0.5 molar. I only have one sig fig. Acetate. One five six nine nine nine. Rounding to one sig fig, this is going to round to point two molar. This is going to lead to some serious round off error in the ammonia and the acetate. I don't necessarily like doing one sig fig things. Okay, what else is present? Acetic acid's present. <coughs> How much acetic acid? Ammonium's present. 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10. Or just 2 times 10 to the minus 10 molar. Ammonium. Ends here, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Rounded, it would be just 2 times 10 to the minus 5. What else? Hydronium. Hydronium. So it's 2.1 times 10 to the negative 15, is that right? 14. So it's just going to round 2 times 10 to the negative 14 molar. Anything else? Did we get everything from all the steps? We're looking at where it ends. Hydroxide, yeah. Let's go ahead and put that up here. The hydroxide concentration? All right. Well, we're not allowed this many. So this is going to come out to 0.5 molar. Hydroxide is the strongest base that can exist in water. So all that amide was converted into hydroxide. Then we add a little bit of hydroxide. We add a little bit of hydroxide from the ammonia. We add a little bit of hydroxide from the acetate. And we add a little bit of hydroxide from the water, KW. But those amounts are extremely small. Now we can either do the pH or the pOH. You know, um, maybe I'll do the pOH, 0.476. So 0 0.476, I'm carrying extra digits, log plus 14, 13.67, this is going to equal 13.7, so it's quite basic here. All right, any questions on this? All right, what we're going to do is we're going to just um, take a break here, and then I'll start a calculation, the strong acid, strong base calculation. We'll finish it next time, but um, we're also going to do the lab today, so I need to save some time for that. All right, we're going to um, just set up one more mixture at the end. So the last example is going to be, for today, the last example will be 
the strong acid, strong base. So we're going to look at HCl and sodium hydroxide here. The HCl we're going to have is 25.0 milliliters of 0.100 molar. And the sodium hydroxide we're going to call X milliliters of 0.100 molar. There are two types of calculations that we do here. One is the pH and the other is the inventory. If we're interested in the pH type, excuse me, um, pH, we call that uh, just the titration. So looking at a pH titration, we'll <coughs> end up just mapping things out like this. So it starts off here. Um, with just the 0.1 molar HCl. 0.1 molar HCl has negligible um, hydronium from water. You know, the most hydronium we're going to get from water is 10 to the minus 14, um, at a square root, 10 to the minus 7 molar. But because of Le Chatelier's, we're going to get a lot less than that. And so that's negligible. So the pH is just 1. You know, hydronium is 0.1, 10 to the minus 1. And then as we start adding the base, um, we neutralize a little bit of the acid, but it's still excess HCl. So through here, the limiting reagent sodium hydroxide, the excess reagent HCl. HCl is a strong acid, keeps the pH low. But as we get closer and closer um, to the equivalence point, at the equivalence point, we have just the right amount of base to neutralize the acid, and we end up with just salt and water. But as we get closer, then the amount of excess acid remaining is very, very small. And if we have very, very small amount of excess acid, then um, water becomes a significant contributor to hydronium. So calculations very close to the equivalence point require Kw. You know. When we hit the equivalence point, um, pretty much we don't need to do anything because, except for Kw, because this reaction at the equivalence point just produces sodium chloride and water. Sodium ions don't hydrolyze water. Chloride ions don't hydrolyze water. So the only thing hydrolyzing water is water. And so we just look at Kw. So this is pH 7, pH neutral. if stoichiometric. Stoichiometric means we have equivalent amounts of acid and base. So this is if stoichiometric at the equivalence point. Then what happens is we go past the equivalence point and <coughs> the pH starts to climb because we'll have excess sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. So right here, we barely have any excess hydroxide. If we barely have any excess hydroxide, then most of the hydroxide being produced is from Kw. So very close to the equivalence point, but past it, Kw. And then up here is just excess strong base, which is going to dominate. And Kw won't be a significant contributor at these high pHs. What else is shown on this, this pH titration curve is what indicators are suitable. So if we use phenolphthalein, phenolphthalein changes to pink at pH 9. Well, pH 9 is too late. I mean, this should change, I mean, at pH 7. That is, that's where our equivalence point is. And so this shows a discrepancy between the end point, where the indicator changes, and the equivalence point, where we've neutralized it. And so the end point is actually past this. So there's a little bit of error when we use phenolphthalein. But how much error is it? 
Well, when we look in terms of milliliters, it's barely anything because this line's near vertical. And so how many drops did it take to go from the equivalence point to the black circle to the end point where it goes light pink? That's not even one drop. That's much less than one drop you know, when we look at how many actual milliliters that is. However, if we use Eliza in yellow, Eliza in yellow, we're looking for this green. And it doesn't change green until pH 11. So if we wait until we get to pH 11, then we've already well passed the equivalence point here by maybe about a two milliliters, one or two milliliters past. But here, it's not even one drop time. So phenolphthalein works. A better indicator would be bromothymol blue. Bromothymol blue turns green, so it's yellow in acid, blue in base, and green at pH about seven. And so bromothymol blue would be perfect for this. The only problem with bromothymol blue is it's hard. You know, you get different shades of green and yellow. So you get this yellow green, is that it? Or you get a green yellow, is that it? Or you get a green green or green blue. And so it's really hard to, to come up with a consistent green because you'll have to stop at that exact shade of green each time where it's much easier to go from colorless to pink. It's much more difficult to titrate to <coughs> a particular shade of green. Same thing goes with methyl red. Methyl red would work. It changes a little bit early, but the error is very small. Brome phenol blue would also work. It changes green a little bit early, but that should still work. Thymol blue won't work. Thymol blue changes too early. So we're like three milliliters off here. And so it's showing different indicators, but you know that's a Chem 1A style titration. In Chem 1B, we do a pH titration. So we don't even have to add any indicator here. We could easily pinpoint the equivalence point by the shape of the curve. And that's fine. But basically, we want to do um, different calculations in this. And so the first step is always going to be solution dilution. And so let's see what the book is asking you to calculate. Uh, they're asking me to calculate A before the addition of any sodium hydroxide. So this is the pH of 0.100 molar HCl, which is pH 1. After the addition of 24 milliliters, so this is right before the equivalence point. The equivalence point should happen at 25 milliliters of base, so the equal amounts of acid and base. So this one milliliter before, at 25, which is the equivalence point, and at 26, one milliliter after the equivalence point. And so what we'll probably do is we'll do some calculations not at those points. Um, one thing the book does is they like millimoles. They like, in the ice table, rather than using concentrations, they use amounts. You can do that as long as you change it to concentrations at the end, you know, at the equivalence. Um, <coughs> uh, excuse me, at equilibrium. Otherwise, it's not going to equal K. K is not based on the amounts in millimoles. It's based on mol molar concentration. So your book uses millimoles. Millimoles is easy. Uh, just take milliliters times molarity. That gives you millimoles. I um, like to use concentration myself. So we know that we'll start off at pH 1, and then it's going to increase just slightly, but this is excess acid, so the pH start is low. And then there's going to be a steep, long rise here. At the equivalence point, we should have a pH of 7. And <clears throat> this is where we've neutralized it to salt and water. Over here, we have excess acid. 
Over here, we'll have excess base. And so um, the equivalence point should come in at 25 milliliters here. And so what we'll do is we'll calculate it at the half equivalence point, 12 and a half milliliters here. So I'm going to have my 25 milliliters, 25.0, let's say. We'll go with three sig figs this time. 25.0 milliliters of HCl, concentration 0.100 molar. And then to this, we're going to add from the burette 12.5 milliliters of NaOH. This is 0.100 molar. And so we'll have to do our step I. And this is going to give us 37.5 milliliters. But the concentrations are no longer going to be what we originally had. And so the HCl in this mixture is going to be, what's the dilution factor for the HCl? Oh, yeah, 32.5. Thanks. What's the dilution factor for the HCl? Twenty-five over fifty-seven point five. Twenty-five over fifty-seven point five. Oh. Are we adding thirty-two? Oh, actually, no. It's it shouldn't be. No, we're adding twelve and a half. Oh. So tw it should. I uh, sorry. It should be thirty-seven point five. So it's 12 and a half plus 25 gives us 37.5. So the dilution factor is going to be 25 over 37.5 times the concentration, 0.100 molar. What does it come out to? 0 0.0667. Did you round that? Yeah. Uh, right. All right. We'll carry an extra six then. Don't worry. How about the uh, sodium hydroxide? What's the dilution factor there? 12 and a half over 37 and a half. So this is going to be half of that. So it's going to be 0 0.0333 sub 3 molar. I'm going to do this to three, um, three sig figs. I don't want to round it because it's going to change this a little bit. And so I'm going to have my HCl and NaOH. But what I'm going to do is I'll um, continue this later. What we're going to do um, now is, since we aren't going into the computer lab, we're going to take a progress check of our crystals. If you have crystals, then um, we're going to do one more recrystallization. So if you have crystals, take about half the crystals, and then we're going to recrystallize those. If you have no crystals, um, what we're going to do is we're going to hot plate it and then just gently evaporate liquid. We want to get the liquid level very low. So uh, it depends um, what you have. If you have just a little bit of crystals, then don't divide them in half. If you have just a little bit of crystals, hot plate it and get the liquid volume down. If you have no liquid then and only solid residue, then um, add a little bit of water and throw it on the hot plate and dissolve it in hot water. Don't dissolve it in cold water. What we want to do is we want to get a very concentrated solution on the hot plate and then cool that concentrated solution in ice water and then um, I have some ethanol in the back. We can add ethanol to get some crystallization if no crystallization is happening. <coughs>